And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple. Some of you may know him as Archon, some of you may know him as the guy who buries me in spreadsheets, and some of you may know him as the as the head honcho of Ascendant Comics, who managed to get Star Spangled Squadron funded in 30 minutes. But I better I best know him as Alexander Macris. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm really good. Thanks for having me back on the show. Thanks for com thanks for coming on, and thanks for doing the doing the um, highlight when I did my review of Ascendant. It's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. So, the last time that I had you on was to talk about Ascendant, and it's it's kind of funny that the that this particular project gets announced as I was finishing the script for that review because one of the things I said is. I want to see some. I want to see the world of Ascendant more. Obviously, there was only so much room you could do that in the core book because, well, with all the stuff you got to account for with Super's games. Yep, yep. Well, I uh, I've been wanting to bring the uh, the world in tighter focus for a while, so the graphic novel is a great way to do it. Which, the last time when I had you on, we were mostly f focusing on your origins when it came to superhero games especially given what you were doing with Ascendant. So I'd like to pivot a little bit into your introduction to superhero comics. Uh, all right, so my introduction to superhero comics came uh, as a boy. Um, would have been about third grade, I think. And my father got me Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, uh, Green Lantern was Hal Jordan, but, I was, but uh, very shortly thereafter, it transitioned to Jon Stewart, uh, and then back to Hal Jordan, Guy Gardner, Green Lantern Corps. Mm -hmm. So happened to be right at this really interesting moment in DC um, when they were doing the Crisis on Infinite Earths and they were revising their canon. They came out with the Man of Steel shortly thereafter. So it was a, a very interesting moment to be a collector. And I got really enthralled. Um, I ended up collecting an enormous amount of Green Lantern comics all the way back through the Green Lantern, Green Arrow part uh, during the 70s, and then um, earlier back all the way to the very start of uh, Hal Jordan. Mm -hmm. I then got into some of the, um, uh, the edgier stuff that was coming out at the time, uh, Frank Miller's Batman, uh, Watchmen. Um, that was kind of the heyday of my collection. I got into some image comics and some indie comics. Uh, and then I stepped away from comics for a really long time. Uh, I got busy with college. I got busy with law school, starting my own company. Um, and then came back uh, when digital comics became a thing and started collecting comics again on Comixology and suddenly found like, hey, every comic I ever wanted is available now and I could read them. So, you know, I finally got to go and read a bunch of classics I'd always wanted to, like Squadron Supreme or... Um, you know, the Marvel Secret Wars and things like that. So it, it's been interesting because, um, you know, I, I essentially I, I have been able to see comics from both the point of view of a kid uh, and now a grown adult and kind of experience the medium two different ways. Even with that, from the way you describe it, it sounds like you were more you were more of a DC guy growing up. Uh, definitely, definitely more of a DC guy growing up. Yeah, and I had a few Marvels. I had some Daredevil. I had some Spider Man, um, but it was primarily Green Lantern. Yeah, if I'm, would it be fair of me to say that the time that you had dipped into Daredevil was during the um, Frank Miller Man Without Fear era? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it was good because I, whenever Daredevil gets brought up, the two eras that people that people will bring up are either the Frank Miller era or the Marvel Knights era. Right. No, and, it was Frank Miller era, Daredevil. And, mm -hmm. well, for the latter, the timeline doesn't quite match up. Right. Right. Huh. Yeah, one of the things I really remember vividly collecting was the What If series of comics from back then. There was a really powerful What If Electra Hadn't Died mm -hmm. issue that I remember. Um, 
where Daredevil ends up giving up being a hero to go be with Elektra. It was, uh, you know, when you think about how commonplace nowadays, you know, multiverse theory is with quantum mechanics and whatnot, Marvel was way ahead of its time with that What If series. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, although, in my personal opinion, um, one-off What If kind of things, or what or what ifs that expanded into further things. Hi, Mayday Parker, how you doing? Um, that's where that kind of thing belongs. I've always been against the idea of introducing multiverses into comic book universes. Oh, really? And because it messes up the canon, or I'd say it's there's certainly the ca- there's certainly the canonicity issue, but I'd say a bigger issue is is um is making the roster that you have in front of you matter. And oddly enough, this was one of the reasons why, according to what I've been what I've been told over the years, why Crisis on Infinite Earth even happened, because DC had felt that the whole multi that the whole alternate universe thing it was getting out of hand, and they felt they need to clean house. That's definitely the case. Yeah. Uh, and. I can certainly I can certainly see that, and it's it's ironic that um, the event comics that came out after Crisis on Infinite Earths, especially the ones from DC, ended up complicating the matter. Um, right. Especially stuff like Zero Hour and Infinite Crisis, which don't get it wrong, are good are are good event comics, even though Zero Hour has the issue of well. When you're dealing with when you're dealing with anything time related, expect stupid. <laughs> well, I think from a content creator's point of view, mm-hmm. when you have a character that's become a brand that needs to sustain a franchise and needs to remain perennially the same so that the audience constantly recognize it and it doesn't mess up the value of the franchise, mm-hmm. multiverse storytelling becomes really appealing because you can tell dramatic stories with no consequences. So yeah. this is this is Batman in Gaslight Gotham, and it doesn't matter what you do. You know, you can have Jack the Ripper murder Robin, and you can have um, Batman break his code against killing, and it doesn't matter because that was just that multiverse, and you move back on. Yeah, and I'll so I get I, I get why they've why they've taken over so much of storytelling because it's really tough as a comic writer to tell a story with your characters that is interesting but also doesn't, you know. Um, mess with "quote unquote" the brand, which is what these big companies care about. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, it doesn't exactly help matters. Then this is this is one thing that I'm glad we see. I'm glad we see in indies and manga that you that is impossible to that um that you end up seeing with the bigger entries, and that is um the writer revolving door. Right. Oh. Um, because, say you get say you get into say you get into a certain comic like let's say um, I was a big I was a big fan of of Abnett's run with Aquaman, mm-hmm. and I will admit I will admit a lot of my interest was I I mostly know Dan Abnett through the work that he's done for Warhammer 40k, and he's done, and he's done really good work on that front, mm-hmm. um, and his run with Aquaman was really damn good. Then he li- then he leaves, and the person who came in after him was not good, and yeah. ju- and just completely killed my invest just completely killed my investment. Um, yeah. And with that ki- with that kind of thing in mind, there's a couple th- there's a couple things that I that I'm curious about first. Now, since my first introduction to Ascendant was the role-playing game, I feel I have to ask, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, uh, the role-playing game came first. Well, okay, it's interesting. So, the origin of the Ascendant universe began in role-playing games that I ran before I created the Ascendant RPG. So, I used a number of different systems for the same world, in the same way that the R and Empire campaign setting existed before Axe existed, mm-hmm. um, so I had run multiple campaigns with my friends featuring some of the characters that later appeared in Ascendant. So, Stiletto predated um, Aurora, predated Ascendant. 
when I created the Ascendant RPG, I did it without a setting at all. And my intent was just to create a GURPS, you know, generic universal superhero system. Mm -hmm. um, I was, and originally it was going to be called the Supermetric System. I was persuaded by my backers that it needed to have a campaign setting. They said, Alex, you know, the value is in intellectual property and people like characters that they can hook into, yada, yada. So I said, well, okay, um, let me think about how I could take these old settings that I had played with uh, years ago and then update them to the modern day and, and use them for Ascendant. So it's a little bit of both, I guess, the chicken in the, the, the chicken stole an egg from another bird, and uh, so it's like a cuckoo. I don't know. This metaphor's gotten really strange. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it got past you on that front. Oh, but the the main re and I think it I think it was the right call because if you look at if you look at other get other supers games even if even if the set even if the setting isn't used by that player base there's at least a setting that can be built that can be built upon. Um, that's right. That's right. Champ this was the case. This is the case with champions. Um, mm -hmm. This is most certainly the case with mutants and masterminds. Emerald City is very in very integral to Mutants and Masterminds' identity. Um, oh. And th those are the... I'd s and um, I, look at some I look at something like Masks, which, tr which um, was trying to go for the, for the young hero aesthetic, a la Young Justice and X-Men, but it had, it had characters, but it didn't have a connective tissue, which I think is the reason why as good as masks was it ha it hasn't been able to stick in a lot of people's eyes and when it comes to the conversation about supers rpgs mm -hmm. um, and of course that's just my, that's just my perspective just the opinion of of one asshole in the middle of nowhere but i th but i think you i think your backers were on were on point with that plus ascendant has a, has a much has a much better title than the super metric system Oh well, thank you. So that was uh, that was actually my wife's suggestion for the name. She liked Ascendant, so uh, that was where we that was where that came up. Uh, I was sitting around riffing on names for superheroes that weren't taken because, of course, you know, superhero is a trademark, so uh, you can't really easily use that word as your term, which is why everybody calls them, you know, metahumans or parahumans or mutants or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, you know, Ascendant really stuck with me. Uh, first off, because for whatever reason, um, all of my games and, and products and user handles and whatnot all start with A, because we have Autark and Archon and Adventure Conquer Kings, so and now we have Ascendant. Mm -hmm. I, and I like I like the symmetry of that. Um, but also, it had a a sense of destiny to it, right? Like it spoke of you know the Greek concept of arete and sort of uh, rising up to meet challenges, and it had kind of a hopeful vibe to it that I liked. Yeah. Which I have seen, I've certainly seen some lean lean into that. Although I think I think some I think some folk um, in trying to in trying to lean into that idea of the aspirational hero end up um, being a bit of the lady doth protest too much, which brings me to one of to one avenue that you that you describe that you describe with the game, or with the game and with the um, setting. Mm -hmm. And that is this idea of a iridium era. Um, mm -hmm. This mixture, you describe it as a you describe it as a iridium age, a mixture of um, have, of iconic mythology of superheroes with a extreme metal with with a um, extreme aesthetic of heavy metal. And to paraphrase the Indiegogo page, um, mm -hmm. tell me about how that how that particular concept of a iridium age came to be and what you and what the goal is for that kind of thing sure sure uh so the iconic superhero uh look and feel you know emerges in the golden age and the silver age of comics and has maintained fairly steady since then um and you know for most of the silver age era I guess all of the Silver Age era, technically, you know, it was limited by the comics code to be very clean and bright. And um, what we saw is that when the comics code went away, people started telling grittier stories and the aesthetic evolved. But we also saw that as grittier stories got told and the aesthetics evolved, um, 
they also started to rub the shine off of the heroes. So, you know, Superman starts to become a more flawed character. And we see that in uh, Injustice, uh, that whole series of, you know, Superman turns to evil. And even in the recent DC movies, um, where Superman is certainly not very bright and shiny. And what I wanted to do was think about how to portray an aspirational hero uh, like an old school Superman, but in a setting that was um, Iron Age in its aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And I felt like uh, that hadn't been done as much. Um, typically, you had, you know, you might have really sexy bad girls and blood and violence, but then everyone was really nihilistic and deconstructed. Or you had uplifting good heroes. Um, and then, you know, things tended to be relatively bloodless and um, clean cut. And I wanted to combine the two. And I think that was a risky move. Um, I've definitely alienated some people who otherwise would have supported the comic because they've said, look, I, you know, I can't buy this for my daughter uh, or I, I won't buy this for my son. And I've alienated some people that might like, you know, the characters of Stiletto or Maximum Leader, but uh, think to themselves, you know, I don't like the 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 patriotic themes of American Eagle or he's too much of a goody goody two shoe or something. Um, and that's fine. You know, not everyone has to like, uh, you know, every comic. Um, but that was the story I wanted to tell. And, and that was the aesthetic I went with. Which I do. I will always appreciate those who stick to their to stick to their guns, because it's as we've learned plenty of times throughout um, storytelling, period, not just comics. The good way to piss everybody off is to try and please everyone. <laughs> yes, yes, that's definitely true. Uh, although, you know, I'm pretty successful at pissing people off um, just across the board, uh, really unintentionally. So maybe it's just maybe it's just a gift. Uh, well, in that in that case, you're in good company. <laughs> uh, no, but I I, I I mean, I've said this before, but. I think it's great to have comics for everybody, but mm-hmm. not every comic needs to be for everybody or should be for everybody. Not every game needs to be for everybody. Um, so I don't try to be for everybody. I, you know, I, I, I'm not everybody. You know, I have a particular worldview. I have a particular set of gifts and talents. I have a particular set of interests. And, you know, some people are going to find that awesome and some people are going to think it's boring or dull or stupid. And th- and that's okay. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so certainly I, I, I stick to my guns and I think I would be uh, I would be a worse creator if I didn't. Yeah. For, but for me the um like the there's for for those who want the for those who want the squeakier approach, there that's gonna be present. For those who want um the not the more nihilistic approach, that's certainly gonna be present. But a lot of, t- but you are correct in the fact that the middle ground is not all that addressed, and this and there's this idea that the two, of, that the two of them are mutually exclusive, which I'd say a fair amount of comics in the 2000s would be an effective counter argument to that. Because the- that ver- that very well may be the case. You know, as I said, that was the era I wasn't tuned in. Yeah, in the in the early, I'd say from around 2000 to 2004, there were some interesting takes from the from the big two that seemed seemed to be, tr- and I'd also say a bit of the um, a bit of the late 90s that seemed to be trying to uh, mix that regard in that regard, and especially since this was when everybody had gotten off of the cocaine high that was the speculation that was the speculation bubble, mm-hmm. and. You started. You started having people able to do <clears throat> darker, sto- um, darker leaning stories, but not necessarily go full nihilistic. And as an aside, um, the idea of evil Superman, I always, I always found boring. Mm-hmm. Uh, that end. That end. If I'm being honest, it's a story that even if you're doing Super- Superman and all but name and go- and going with that, it's a story with a short shelf life. It is. It is. Um, it is. And I think it's because part of the problem is they made Superman so powerful that it's difficult to challenge him. And so 
you know, if you can't realistically challenge him, then what do you do? All right, well, let's make him the challenge. And then, you know, it kind of goes from there. So, uh, and, you know, they, they have no one to blame but themselves for that. Like, Golden Age Superman was perfectly powerful enough. Uh, they didn't need to make him into a god in order to make him an interesting character. Yeah, are, are you familiar with the term power creep? Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you see it all the time. Yeah. And if I'm being honest, I look at that kind of thing as a consequence of two things. One, when you have when you have multiple authors handling the same handling the same character over that over the years with a minimal amount of amount of oversight from DC. And two, oh, what could be considered author itis, or where you, where you have authors trying to trying to one up trying to one up what came before. Mm-hmm. And I tell a lie the third thing. And this is really imp- this I feel is very important. A lack of what is called what is referred to in television as a series bible. Yes, 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 yes. And by your reaction I'm ge- I'm guessing you know exactly what I mean by a series bible. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And it's something that I do it's something that I do think anybody who's anybody who's writing something that has a lot of moving parts should have I know some people like to claim that they that they um that they write and just see where just see where the story goes I don't buy that for a minute <laughs> no it's it's I think it's a really bad way to write um I created an entire series Bible before I started uh, writing ascendant at all and it definitely um it it provides a, a it provides a measure of focus that can otherwise be absent because it keeps your tail moving in the direction it needs to move and it prevents you from developing cheap ways out of your plot problems um mm-hmm. you know there's a there's a temptation when you're writing superheroes to just keep dialing up the challenge level and then you then change the rules to solve the problem. A classic example of this, as we saw in the recent Star Wars movies, when all of a sudden it became pap- capable to kamikaze at light speed, which uh, you know essentially retroactively destroyed every battle for the Death Star because you would never build a Death Star battle station if you could kamikaze it at light speed. You just wouldn't do it. It would be idiotic. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't expect anyone to ever say that Ascendant is the greatest comic ever written or something like that. But gosh, I would be really happy if no one ever said that uh, there was a plot loophole that a five-year-old could have spotted and uh, the way I resolved it destroyed the continuity of my entire canon. Like yeah. that That's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night as a creator. I never want that to happen. I know that's one of the bigger examples and one of the, one of the easy ones to go, to go with, but... One exa- one example that I that I always come to in more recent in recent years of establishing rules and then breaking them, oddly enough, was Man of Steel. Mm-hmm. Because they make a big deal throughout a, throughout a good chunk of, throughout a good chunk of the film that Kryptonians have to ha- have to have a have a bit of an adjustment period when it comes to the benefits of yellow sunlight. Right. And right. Zod's followers having having to wear that armor to essentially filter it out to essentially filter it out so they don't get sensory overload, which is how a few of his underlings end up getting done in by taking that filter off. Then in the climax of it, Zod is just able to take off his armor and have no problems, and the argument was that he trained his whole life to master his senses. Right. Which right. is there's stretching there's stretching things and then there's having Reed Richards drawn and quartered. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and and the whole um, you know really the whole of the Superman mythos always became problematic the more you thought about it um, because uh, you know if the Kryptonians were really that powerful anytime they left their home world, you know why did they stay on their home world? It's just very strange. Um, so, uh, you know, and of course, that's that's the whole plot line of Invincible. What happens if they don't, which, um, you know, becomes a, a really fascinating world building tool. 
Um, but, it, you know, and it got increasingly ludicrous as they made them more and more powerful. And he tries to solve that, as you say, by having this whole thing, well, you know, it's not instant, it's really uncomfortable, and blah, 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 blah. And then it all just kind of got thrown out the window. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, because it's, it's funny, it's funny that people, that, um, an argument that I, an argument that I often hear with, um, with, soup with, a character like Superman is that because of how powerful he is that he's boring. Mm hmm Um And yet and yet and yet I and yet when I look at um when I look at certain characters in various manga who are or 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 other mediums or or for or for that matter, even some even some of the characters I see in say Hindu myth who mm -hmm. would, who makes who makes Superman look like it look like a joke by comparison in terms of in terms of the cosmic level stuff that they pull off, right? Um, I fi I find the boring ar argument to be a bit to be a be a get, be a classic case of missing the point. You know, tr trying to trying to apply a style a style of hero that it, that doesn't that doesn't fit. Well, I, I think it's part of the problem is that Superman was created to, you know, defend the city of Metropolis in his original incarnation. Mm -hmm. And his original power level was totally appropriate to that, right? Like he could pick up a car, he could uh, absorb a bullet, he could move faster than a train, he could leap over a building. Mm -hmm. When he gets to the power level where he can, you know, move a planet, you, you just you begin to wonder, like, you know, why the heck is this guy wasting his time as a journalist in Metropolis defending the city? It just it just becomes silly. And, you know, those Hindu characters or those manga characters um, are generally presented at, at a much more mythological level of struggle. Uh, you know, or, you, you know, you consider something like, you know, Zeus versus Typhon, right? Like, you know, that that's an adequate challenge level for Zeus. You know, he doesn't he doesn't get out of bed to uh, arrest uh, you know, no good nicks in Metropolis. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, it's it's power creep, right? It's power creep that that um, makes the stories that used to be told impossible to tell and people don't know what to do. And so, oh, well, now he's a bad guy or, oh, he just happens to love Metropolis or, you know, whatever, whatever they go with. So the other thing is when you're make when you're making someone a, when you're making someone do a heel do a um if you'll forgive me for using a wrestling term a heel turn mm -hmm. um you have to make you have to make it so that it so that it doesn't come out of nowhere that it that there's a logical thing and those can those kind of proper turns to villainy take time yes exactly you know well it, this raises a really great point which is that part of the problem is that we no longer know in our society what a villain is and uh, that's the great disappointment of the um, the Darth Vader uh, transformation that we see Anakin Skywalker go through in the prequels, which is that they don't really understand what makes a villain tick, and they don't really understand the nature of evil as writers because our society has um, lost touch with its own moral code, I would argue. And so the best they could come up with is, well, he gets really angry and he kills kids. And so that that's that's how we know he's evil now. Um, I think the, when I I remember I remember going back and rewatching the prequels about about a month ago, which as bad as as bad as they could get, I will take them over the sequels any day of the week. Because I, I agree, would, I would I because agree. at the very le it's for the same reason it's for the same reason that I'd rather have a a. I'd rather have a janky game whose heart is in the right place than a polished game who isn't. Mm -hmm. And I think the the in, the intent was was the whole was the whole deal with was the whole deal with the devil kind of thing, but the pro but the problem is it was a mismanagement of was a misuse of um, time. Oh, because you go, you go, you go from you go from the prodigy to a, to a prodigy with a bit of arrogance to him getting his ass kicked by Dooku to to trying to trying to ram a bunch of stuff in um in episode three. 
And oddly, oddly enough, I'd say the, I'd say the better representation of these signs of 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 that heel turn, oddly enough, happened in the Clone Wars series. Uh, which yeah. I didn't watch, but I, I've heard it was actually quite good. Yeah, because they had t- because they had time. Also, mm-hmm. Gendy Tartakovsky is a better writer. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. If you can make an entire if you can make an entire miniseries work with no dialogue possible, I think he's I think he knows what the hell he's doing. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. It definitely takes time to do a to do a good. Uh, sort of a good heel turn, a good bad guy. Yeah. Um, if, but it also, if I can use, oh, if I can use a bit of, a, not to double down on a on a rest on wrestling again, but if I can use an example when it comes to that, one that instantly comes to mind for me is um, Jimmy Havoc, who was a, a few years ago was he's retired now, but he was a rising star in the British wrestling scene, but had he had mostly. He had mostly made a name for himself in death matches, and he and even with that, he he had worked as as this underdog. When he finally when he finally flipped, it was after after having a technical match where he actually held his own, even though he lost. But his mindset was: no matter what I do, um, I'm only going to be seen as a de- as a death match guy. And I can do more. I can do more than that. Mm. And that took. That I, was you know, a, I just. Over the I just. Of, of like two years. I just can't intelligently comment on pro wrestling because I haven't. Um, I haven't ever really followed it. So. Which I'll I'll, ha- I'll have to take your word for it. It's funny because I see I see wrestling tropes mentioned all the time on TV tropes, mm-hmm. but I, I um you know so I, that's how I know heel turn is from actually from TV tropes, not from wrestling. Yeah, the reason why I, the reason why I'm bringing up the these kind these kind of things is not ju- not just because I'm a fan of of in, of Indian international wrestling, which I am, but also t- to de- to demonstrate that if that um I know a lot I know a lot of people have have liked to use the remark that a villain is a is the hero of their own story, but. Maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of people have misinterpreted that. Mm, mm-hmm. And tried, That's interesting. And tried to make the and tried to make the villain into a hero. Um, I definitely think that's true. Yeah, definitely mm. think that's true. I mean, the thing is, a a villain is not just the hero of his own story. If you a hero has to change over the course of a story. Mm-hmm. Um, a villain typically does not, and that's what makes them different. A villain has already become who he is and is now attempting to accomplish whatever his villainous goal is. A hero is on a journey to become someone he is not yet. And so um, you know, failing, failing to understand that is a big problem for storytelling where... Um, you know, writers are terrified of having characters change uh, in any meaningful way for fear of damaging the brand. Um, and so instead, you know, we get the kind of hackneyed, uh, oh, you know, finally they feel good about themselves kind of change that we now see in virtually every story that gets told. Um, and they end up, they, you know, the, the, the villains end up being more interesting and actually are kind of anti-villains in a sense, so... Yeah, and I know I know a lot of people like to bring up Magneto in this regard, who's who's been on both sides of the glass over the years. Mm-hmm. But the key th- the key thing with the key thing with Mag- the key thing with someone like Magneto is the fact that while his motivations are understandable, his methods are supposed to be not def- not as defensible. Hmm. And I think for the most part, Magneto is a relatively interesting character as far as they go. Um, he's certainly one of the better crafted Marvel villains that's ever been developed. Um, and, you know, it gets it gets interesting nowadays when, you know, he gets kind of positioned as a uh, in the context of nationalism and how that gets addressed. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's for Marvel to worry about. I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um. 
if you'll if you don't mind me using a a a um, example in Star Trek, the person who always comes to mind when it comes to villains, and uh, oddly enough, is a case of somebody who was who did his job too well, is Gul Dukat. Which series is that from? Deep Space Nine. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't watch Deep Space Nine, so I apologize. Um, but it, was he uh, was he the head of the Dominion? No, he was he was a he was a, a he was an agent for the Cardassians. And uh, okay. He saying having someone be the head of the Dominion is is. A bit tr- is a bit tricky to go with, because you see, because you never see that outright head, the way you might see a might see the emperor in, for the Kl- for the Klingons or something or the president for the for uh, Starfleet. It's just it's just not how they operate. But with Go- with Gold du- with Gold Ducat, he was he was a he was very much a patriot for for um for the in, for what he believed are the best interests of Card- of Cardassians and had a sense of destiny about him. I'm um, vastly simplifying. There's a video by um SF Debris that went that went into a much deeper character study, but the problem was when he when he was supposed to, when it seemed like you had a natural end for him, they brought him back. And it's largely considered a mistake, and but an understandable mistake because they did such a good job with the character that they had a hard time letting him go. Right. Yep. 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 Well, I mean, you know, that's uh, every writer. Every writer runs into that problem of you have characters you love, and you know they've done their part in the story, but you want to keep them around. It's. Uh... It's it's an easy trap to fall into for sure. Yeah. Now, getting getting to close getting to closer matters. Um. Now, with some with something like Star Spangled Squadron, huh? this is this is essentially the introduction of a superhero group. As yes. well, as just as just as much as the world itself. And when you ha- when you're introducing that many people there's there can be the issue of um e- of people getting lost in the shuffle because you don't have a perspective character is mm-hmm. that something that you've ke- that you've kept in mind to make sure that there's at least there's at least some roam that all roads lead to uh so yeah so there's two perspective characters in the story it's american eagle and stiletto mm-hmm. and so the story is largely told through their perspective with a bit of third-person storytelling that follows uh, one of the villains. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a chapter with American Eagle's point of view, we have a chapter with Stiletto's point of view, uh, and then we go into the squadron story where uh, American Eagle and Stiletto um, are both in play along with the other heroes. And then it ends uh, back on, focused on American Eagle and Stiletto again. So it's definitely the case that the other members of the squadron don't get as much attention. So we don't spend as much time on Aurora. We don't spend as much time on warp stronghold, Dr. Quantum. Um, although they do engage in some, some really awesome heroics, uh, during the battle. Mm -hmm. Um, but from, but we get two, but we get inside two characters heads. I think that's important. It would be overwhelming to try and be inside six people's heads and it would be kind of cold and unwelcoming to not have anybody as a perspective character. So I compromised. I went, Kind of, uh, you know, one goody two shoe and and one kind of antihero. Yeah, and I, I will ad- I will admit when I when I when I saw Stiletto, I remember so- I remember some people taking issue with her with her design, but I was like, um, I could see the I could see the method in the mad in the madness as it were, mm. and um, if anything, I was remind I was reminded a lot of Lady Deathstrike. Oh yeah, Lady Deathstrike was definitely an inspiration for her. Uh, Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a comic that my friend um, uh, David Campetti wrote called Jade Warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was an inspiration for Stiletto. Uh, Pamela Anderson's Barbed Wire. So you know all of these um, femme fatale characters uh, kind mm-hmm. of fed in. Um, you know, plus just experiences from my own life, um, having various adventures around the world, and you know meeting some badass women. 
uh, you know, going to goth clubs, things like that. So all kind of uh, ruminated together and, and stiletto emerged. Yeah. And in th in that regard, I'm, I'm guessing the reason you chose those two as as the as your for your approach is because of the fact that they're on that they're on opposite opposite ends of the spectrum one of them is is try, is trying to be that is trying to be is trying to be that that le that central fit that central figure as we've ta as we've talked about with superman and the like whereas with someone like stiletto it the vibe that i always get is somebody who's somebody who's um seen the darker side of things and is tr it is trying to go clean but old habits die hard yeah i think that's right um the i thought the story would be interesting to be able to tell by having that black white apples orange comparison that's exactly right and the interaction between the two i thought i found fun um and it also lets me let you see the world through two different lenses um you know the world how we'd like it to be and the world how we're afraid it is um mm -hmm. and i try and go out of my way as i as i write to make it clear that you know neither american eagle nor stiletto is entirely correct in their worldview there and um you know they're both making some assumptions that could be wrong they both make mistakes um because of you know how they judge situations and we see that those mistakes have consequences mm -hmm. um you know, we see, you know, we, we, we get a little bit of a glimpse of how much Stiletto is fronting to try and, and deal with her personal pain. Um, you know, now, that being said, I think a lot of readers, when they read a comic, don't engage necessarily with that stuff. And they just want a really enjoyable action action comic with, you know, lots of, um, you know, fun dialogue, great action, shoot them up, beat them up, slice mm -hmm. them up. And I definitely tried to offer that, too. So... Uh, to the extent that anyone says, hey, I really enjoyed these themes and this contrast, then, you know, that's um, uh, it's definitely uh, uh, gratifying to me. But I'm also expecting a lot of people to, to just, you know, enjoy the comic the way they enjoy Marvel movies. And that's fine, too. And truth be truth be told, I've shied away from discussing th uh, discussing um, themes, uh, themes alone in my in my in my critiques. If only because I, if only because I find it to be a bit hollow, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. I e. Um, I've had, and critical drinker had do, had done a, had done a video a few years ago talking talking about this issue, but the issue that I have with just talk with just talking about themes is that if you phrase it right, you can sit, you can you can talk about themes with just about anything. And if you can do that so easily, then it doesn't have a whole lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think that's true. Like, there are certain frameworks people learn to apply, and um, they they essentially teach you how to manufacture themes where perhaps none were intended. Um, you know, I and, 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 and it ends up um, almost creating, like, a very sophomoric engagement with... Um, with the material and, and we're seeing that a lot a lot of critical theory gets applied in really pure ways i do think there's some themes in my work that are that that are there intentionally um but i also you know i i, I really tried not to i wasn't trying to write a thematic work yeah. you know i think theme, themes have to emerge from your subconscious as you write i um an example that i often use of this kind of thing is and i don't i don't know where or when this started but i do remember seeing this get bandied about is the claim they claimed that there were some that there were some AIDS allegories within the original Alien. Uh huh. Which so I, I hadn't heard that one. I did know that there was there was some definitely male pregnancy uh, allegories, um, but I didn't know about the AIDS ones. Oh, uh, I mean, like obviously there's the whole there's the whole thing with the face hugger, but oh. Uh, I, but I think we've. I think it's been established that face huggers don't re don't really care don't really care about gender. <laughs> oh. Right. But I look at I look at something like that as as more of tapping into that very primal fear of violation, for the same reason that some, that um something like something like the Borg in Star Trek can be can 
can be one step away from a horror show. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That and the that and um, just ge just general fear of loss. But again, this again, it's a case of there's there's no problem with looking f with examining themes and stories, but it's important to make sure that you don't um, you that you don't get that you don't get lost in the forest, and tr and are trying to look trying to look for things that aren't tr are, that aren't there. Right. Right. Yeah, you see that a lot when people try and read modern issues into um, into older works where, you know, those themes didn't even exist in the mind of the writers. Um, and, it, you know... Uh, I'd say the best analogy is the, is the curtains blue joke. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've heard, I'm sure you've heard that gag at least once. Maybe not. Uh, the it's a well it's a well worn joke I've I've seen I've seen among critics of the of the bad critic who thinks that the right that the writer descri the writer described blue curtains as a metaphor for the writer's own depression and the actual writer's like no I just I just had blue curtains ah yes yes well I think the um you know the one possible answer to that, and, and I said this, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, is that a writer doesn't necessarily know what his subconscious is putting into the work. And I have definitely had people remark to me, hey, I noticed some things about your personality that appeared in such and such work. Was that intentional? And it wasn't intentional, but it definitely was me. And so I think the writer in that sense might have been wrong. Like, he actually might have been depressed, and that's why all the colors in his novel were somber. Um, so I, I think there is some value in sussing out those kind of themes. Um, where I get annoyed is when people apply a very 21st century um, uh, topic-specific lens to look for whatever set of themes is currently trending. Like, you know, what is this, you know, how does this speak to concerns over COVID, you know, or, um, you know, understanding the Ukraine war in the context of Shakespeare or shit like that. Uh, it's like Shakespeare ha gave no shits about COVID or the Ukraine war. He was writing about the themes of his day. I'd say he was, That's say he was more, he was more concerned on finding new and interesting ways to sneak in um, shit talking his rival theaters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's where I get really irked with, with literary criticism these days, is the need to make everything relevant to contemporary issues rather than the need to make things relevant to um, archetypical themes uh, of timelessness. And for me, I, for me I've, I've, there are certain themes that are, that are always going to be timeless, and those, and those themes are the ones that have been passed down even even to the even to the days of just sharing campfire stories um, but one per, one particular thing that thing that comes that comes up especially when you're dealing with heroes is what to is what to do after someone's gone through the the hero's journey of a, of a sort i.e once they've accomplished that goal of becoming a hero, mm -hmm. uh, is that is that something that you've that you've thought about in lo in long term? Because there's already yeah. a framework for the hero's journey, but the, but once you get past the point of them becoming that heroic figure, there's the question of then what? Right, and I think at that point you have to not tell the hero's journey story. Mm -hmm. um, the you know. Much, much to the disbelief of Hollywood, right? There's actually other stories you can tell. Like, not every story has to be the hero's journey story. There's a lot of different timeless plot lines. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, that said, the hero's journey is a powerful story, and I think it's one we all respond to, and it's a great starting point. Um, but, you know, uh, the... Um, you know, there there are there are other tales uh, one can tell. You know, uh, war movies aren't necessarily a hero's journey. Um, tragedies 
don't have to be a hero's journey. Now, I think one can go too far in the other direction and you end up with characters that don't transform at all or don't change or are static. Um, so it, it, it's definitely hard. I mean, look, uh, writing is really hard and, and most, most product that gets written sucks uh, and, and all, gets read by almost nobody and is quickly forgotten. Um, that's the, you know, that's, that's just like the, the, the frightening thing about putting yourself out there is most people, most people never put themselves out there. And then most people who do put themselves out there, you know, actually don't do a good job. Um, so, you know, you, you almost have to, um, you know, you all almost have to be delusional to be a writer and somehow believe that, you know, even though human beings have been writing for 4,000 years and telling every story they can think of, that somehow you're going to have the story that is going to be worthwhile. Um, and you have to convince yourself of that, knowing that it's probably not the case, but that it certainly will be the case if you don't try. Yeah. So... And I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer. Like I, it, you know, uh, I'm not going to be writing a book on how to, uh, how to, how to write, uh, uh, stories anytime soon. I feel like I'm still learning my craft and, um, I think, ev I think and, everybody says that they're still learning their craft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that said, somehow there's a hundred books on the bookshelf of how to write stories by people I've never heard of. So they, uh, they apparently think they figured it out. Um, yeah, not. I've se I've seen more than my fair share of of the, of um of people who think who think that they've found the um per the ideal formula which doesn't exist. Um, if if it di if it did exist, then everybody'd be doing it. Well, the closest I've seen is uh, Save the Cat, which is a Hollywood screenwriting formula, and I read that book and. Um, and people that are fans of the book Save the Cat would claim, in fact, that that is what everyone does. And you can you can really see its influence on Hollywood. And whether whether he identified a pattern that preexisted or people are consciously following that pattern, it's definitely real. Like once you've read that book, you can watch Hollywood movies and actually predict key plot moments just by how many minutes have passed. It's kind of mind blowing. Yeah, it it is. Though I never I never want to be the I never want to be one of those particular cynics who who, ha who has the I've seen it all kind of attitude I mean I didn't want to be either I read the book not really knowing it was going to uh, pull the curtain up and uh, you know it's like now you can't unsee it so ah mm -hmm. uh, don't don't read the book it's a trap it's a trap <laughs> it's a tarp it's a tarp um, but yeah, that's the closest I've seen to a book that really nailed it for a particular medium. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And with that, now with that in with that in mind, since we've we've talked about we've talked about two members of the squadron, but I, even though the, even though they're obviously not going to be getting a whole lot of the focus, I think tackling some of the other members of the squadron should would be apropos for us. Okay. Okay, so I'd kind of like to go into them and ju and just some of the influences for for that for those characters. Sure, sure. Um, well, so uh, Aurora is an Instagram model and uh, reality TV show contestant who desperately wants to be this sort of dazzling s celebrity in the spotlight. She wants to be a star, and her ascendant powers manifest and she becomes a star um and she views the world through the lens of someone who's always wanted to be famous and now is famous but not for what she expected she'd be famous for and you know do they just love me because of my powers and so she's a character who's you know she knows she's beautiful she knows she's famous at the same time she has some self-esteem problems um and she's uh you know she's fronting a lot to maintain a a sense of confidence um so she's she's playing a role that she thinks she has to play and there's a wonderful interaction between her and stiletto in the comic that was a lot of fun to write um and she's a she's a very fun character uh then there's um stronghold stronghold was a a, a scrawny working class uh hispanic kid who used to get beat up a lot and he wanted to be strong enough to protect the people he cared about and um and so he when his powers manifested, he became, you know, a physical titan. Um, 
he is, you know, he's in, in many ways, he's just an average dude who, you know, he enjoys video games and pizza and pretty girls. And he, he loves his grandma who raised him. And, um, and he just, you know, he kind of wants to just be a good dude and help people. So, um, not a lot of, uh, you know, he's not a complex person and, and that's okay. Not, not every person is a complex melodramatic person. Some people are, some people are pretty simple. Um, then you have, uh, Warp was a YouTube star who was at the height of his popularity when superpowers began to manifest. And um, suddenly being an ordinary YouTube star wasn't that interesting in a world of people who could fly or, you know, use psychokinesis. And um, rather than fade from the limelight, he began to do increasingly desperate stunts in an attempt to cause, you know, superpowers to manifest. So it very much became, uh, you know, I'm either going to become a hero or die trying. And he ended up manifesting the power to teleport um, because he, he tried to base jump without a parachute to generate the power to fly. And uh, as he was about to crash into Earth, he, he really desperately wished he was just back home. And boom, he was back home. So Warp has the power to teleport. Mm -hmm. Then the final character is Dr. Quantum. She's a quantum physicist, super genius, and was researching quantum physics of superpowers developing and accidentally gave herself superpowers. So she's the genius of the team, um, very powerful, you know, can, can, can manipulate the quantum level of reality. Um, and, uh, you know, is also a, a, a you know, um, a giant nerd. She plays role playing games with her friends um, and uh, is, you know, uh, on the spectrum, super smart. Mm -hmm. So she's she's uh, so she's very much, um, you know, the anti Aurora in many ways. And they have a fun interaction as well. Yep. So that and that th those six members form the team. What I what I find interesting regarding how you described Aurora is that it's it's very easy to to take the archetype of a Instagram or a social media star or influencer or what have you and have them portray a almost narcissistic character. Um mm -hmm. Like I, th I think of, I th when I think of that kind of idea of a social media villain, um, mm. one who instantly comes to mind is some is the is the Marvel villain Screwball, uh. Uh, who is rel is relatively new to it. In fact, I only found out about Screwball through her through her appearance in the um, PS4 video game. But is de but is def definitely has that whole. Li that whole live that whole live streaming stunts kind of approach, uh huh? But taking but going with a more going with a hero approach that just that is de that is dealing with a, the proverbial monkey's paw, right? Is an interesting an interesting way to go about it. Um. Well, I, I guess my own brushes with internet fame have definitely been very much a monkey's paw. And um, and that probably impacted how I wrote the character. I think fame in today's society is very much a two-edged sword. And every person I know who posts on Instagram or Twitter, um, you know, wakes up every day thinking, I wonder if this is the day where I'm going to accidentally destroy my career or get my page deleted or um, get banned or have Instagram say I you know, my image was too sexy and I'm losing my account or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a scary time to be, uh, to be famous in a sense, um, because there's no escape. It never turns off. Uh, everyone is always online talking about you all the time and everything you do everywhere you go can be tracked, uh, can be photographed. Um, it's, you know, it's not like the old days when celebrities could have entire sham marriages that no one, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and private lives. So um, I think that's the trap that Aurora finds herself in. You know, she's gotten everything she ever wanted and um, and now she has to live up to it. And it turns out it's it's really hard to live up to. Yeah. Now, with with that kind of thing in mind, you're shooting for, a, you're shooting for, I think, 96 pages, correct? Uh, I mean, we've already finished it. Yeah, right. it's 96 pages. It's already written. It's done. Yep. So, given the amount of characters that you have to introduce within within that span within that span of time, um, how easy or difficult was it to ba to balance all the all the moving parts? 
how easy or difficult was it? Um, I would say that writing the graphic novel was uh, an order of magnitude easier than designing the game. Um, you know, the, the game was 500 pages and took about two years to write. And the graphic novel was 96 pages and took about three months to write. Um, I think I benefited from having many years of experience as a game designer and as a game master in building out worlds and developing story arcs and long running um, plot lines. Uh, so those aspects weren't very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, where I had the biggest learning curve was in learning the actual medium of sequential art storytelling. Um, because, uh, you know, in a graphic novel, um, you as the writer, you know, they always tell a writer, like, show, don't tell. But as a writer uh, of, a, of a graphic novel, you're not, show you're not showing anything, actually. That's what the, that's what the um, artist is doing. So you're simultaneously doing two things. You're writing to tell the artist what you want the artist to show. Then you're also writing to tell the audience what's not being shown. And it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance there because um, the description, when, when, when you write a novel, the description and the dialogue, et cetera, are all happening in the same voice, right? Like you're always in the, with the protagonist seeing things from their point of view. When you write a graphic novel or a comic book, on the one hand, you're writing to the artist to tell them what to draw. And then on the other hand, you're also writing to the audience um, of, you know, this is the this is the dialogue that the audience is actually hearing. This is the sound effect that the audience is hearing, um, which which is a learning curve. And uh, and and it takes a minute and you kind of have to figure out also how are you going to communicate with your artist? Um, so I think I, after doing it, I can see why uh, so many comic books get adapted into film, because it's really halfway between the novel and the movie as a medium, um, the comic, the comic writer kind of sits halfway between a screenwriter and a novelist, I think. Mm -hmm. So that, that to me was the most challenging part. I was fortunate that um, I had a really good mentor, uh, my friend David Campetti, um, who uh, taught me the ropes and, and that, that made it possible. I don't think I could have done it without that friendship. Mm -hmm. And with that kind of thing in mind, I do want, obviously, given... Given what I do, I can't not talk about the trading card thing. <laughs> huh? Um, because because of because of their use as character sheets for Ascendant. And mm -hmm. one thing one thing that I'm curious about is because what I was what I was very much reminded of was was some of the um, card game ideas that that both Marvel and DC flirted with. Especially back in the '90s, the um, overpower card game from Marvel. Yep, yep. I'm wonder. I'm wondering if that was if that was something you were uh, unintentionally calling calling back to by doing trade by doing a trading card thing as an add-on. No, you know what it actually was um, is that uh, I kept um, backing various Indiegogo comic projects and they all sent me cool trading cards. And I was like, I want to have cool trading cards for my graphic novel. And then I figured if I was doing trading cards, I may as well integrate them with my role-playing game to where you could use them as character sheets. Mm -hmm. So it was not, um, there was no grand, uh, no grand plan other than I thought the trading cards were really cool when other people sent me theirs. And I thought, well, if I think this is really cool, I bet other people think they're cool. And so let's do it. So it was just a, it was just a rule of cool thing. Which, fair fair point. I already said that sometimes I end up I end up overanalyzing and seeing seeing things I may, I maybe shouldn't. Well, you know, it's like I said. Uh, I mean, certainly I grew up with tra with trading cards, and I grew up with Magic the Gathering games like that. So, um, you know, it's entirely possible that all of that was kind of like floating around in my subconscious. Um, who knows? Who knows? Oh. Which I I can I can certainly I can certainly see that, um, and and one since I since um the Ascendant RPG book is is one of the backer is one of the backer tiers, um, 
one question that I do have in the back of my mind, and maybe you answered this on the Discord or elsewhere, but do you do you pl do you plan on so on some sort of adventure or some sort of setting support down the road for the R for the RPG proper to kind of tie in with the characters in S Star Spangled Squ Squadron? Yeah, there's going to be uh uh well, there's already a capital city gazetteer, which um is our fictional city of capital city. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an ascendant rogues gallery, which uh, has lots of new characters, teams. Uh, and data about the world. And then we're going to be doing the Capital City Case Files, which is a series of um, adventures set in Capital City. So um, there's there's absolutely going to be support for the game and for the world. And I think uh, I think it'll help us flesh out. And there's going to be subsequent graphic novels as well. So um, I'm, I'm really hoping to kind of, you know, build out an entire kind of, you know, mini Marvel or mini DC type universe um, that uh, uh, you know, people can can experience on different lay ways. You know, they can enjoy it as an RPG. They can enjoy it as a graphic novel, um, uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for Star Spangled Squadron? I mean, the the book is written, so um, as soon as the money comes in, I will send it off to the printers and start getting it manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, the only question is how long it takes to go from manufacturer to reach us. Um, it took a really long time to get Ascendant uh, printed and shipped uh, because of the supply chain woes. So I've given myself to November. Um, I really don't expect it to take that long, uh, but that's what I've given myself as a window. But the moment that money comes in, I've already got the printer lined up and we're going to be good to go. Mm -hmm. Now... With, with that in mind, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how seeing how it plays out and how um how th how this ties into how this ties into ascendant as well. Mm. Cause it's been it's been quite a while since I since I've had a tabletop game cro um cross reference with a with a um, with a comic. In fact, the last time I can think of it was the early 2000s with the Exalted comic from Udon. Uh-huh, uh-huh, Exalted. Yep. And while there was a, while, while there have, there were some comics for things like Dragonlance Fifth Age or Patolis, those were years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't think, it's possible that there may have been one that was more recent, but I can't think of it. And I know there's, com I know there's comics for IPs that have ha that have had lo that have that have been longer running, like the cross media stuff with say BattleTech or 40K, but that doesn't really count for the purposes of this. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Amen. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>